Okay, well, great. Well, uh, welcome everyone. We're so happy to have you here. Um, obviously, you are at Tomatoes as part of our virtual gardening series. Uh, my name is Darby Love. I'm working in uh, Nanaimo North Branch of Vancouver Island Regional Library. I've been at this branch for 10 years, which is a bit of um, a shock to me. Uh, it's a great branch and I get to do wonderful things like this. But before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the traditional unceded territory of the Stanamo and Stananas First Nations, excuse me. And if you want to acknowledge which territory you're on in your chat, please go for it. We're also going to send uh, put out a little poll, um, just gathering a little bit of information about you. I'm just launching it right now, just about how you heard about the program what you think your gardening experience is and uh, where you're located because we're, we're interested in all of those things. And we want to extend our deepest, most heartfelt thanks to the Master Gardeners of the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association for partnering with us on this program. Thank you to Joanne Canning, who is the one with the flowers behind her head for starting the whole thing and to Richard Bernier for taking on the coordination role. And of course, thank you to Dorothy for her expertise on tomatoes today. Um, Dorothy also has a really great a session um, from that link that I put in the chat. It's um, my favorite vegetables and how to grow them. And that's been our most popular of our 2023 season. So just a few housekeeping items. We are recording the session, but the only faces um, and voices that will get recorded are um, myself and my colleague and then our two master gardeners and then the screen. Um, the chat will not come up in the recording whatsoever. And please do use the chat uh, feature um, with, with comments, et cetera, uh, questions about where the handout is, but any gardening related questions that we're gonna save for Dorothy at the end of her talking part, we would prefer that you put them in the Q and A so that we don't miss your important questions. Um, so on my screen, that's on the bottom. It's two little chat bubbles and it says Q&A. Alrighty. Um, and we have closed captions enabled if that is something that you would like to um, use to enjoy today's session. All right. So without further ado, Dorothy Kieser has been a certified master gardener for quite some time, over 12 years. She brings to these library seminars her scientific approach from her career as a biologist and then also her training, I think and a wealth of experience from her own extensive home orchards, vegetable, flower, and rhododendron gardens. In addition to her volunteer work with the Master Gardeners, Dorothy is an active member of the Bevan Learning Garden, a large local community garden which, which features a greenhouse located here in Nanaimo, and has given numerous seminars on many gardening topics to gardening clubs and associations. Dorothy is president for the Vancouver Island chapter, is one of the chapter's mentors to new members, and is part of the steering committee who ensures high standards are kept for the basic training program at VIU. And I can also personally attest that Dorothy reads lots of books. All right, Dorothy, over to you. Sorry about that. I uh, had to deal with a phone first. So um, thank you. That is, was a lovely introduction. And yes, I'm excited to talk about vegetables. Um, and today, of course, specifically tomatoes. Seems to me that maybe uh, talking about just a single subject may not be that riveting, but honestly, when you think about it, what gets grown in most home gardens? Tomatoes, whether you just have a patio or whether you have a full scale garden or whatnot, tomatoes are really, exciting. And uh, so that's what I want to talk about today. And uh, tomatoes come in so many different varieties. They come in, as you can see, yellow, green, red, almost purple, any size you want. Let me just give you a quick rundown of that picture that we have in front of us. And I hope you can see my pointer. Um, the very center one is probably uh, Jean Flamme which is a very sweet yellow. In fact, the yellow tomatoes in general tend to be sweeter because they lack some of the acidity. And so people who have trouble with acidity in tomatoes tend to choose the yellow ones. So we have the yellow ones, we have the green zebras here, we have some kind of Roma tomato there. 
we probably, this may be a gardener's delight. This is probably um, a gold nugget. And this is tiny one, which is the size of a grape, is called yellow grape. And they are the sweetest tomatoes that I can conceivably think of. So this is just a very small fraction of the range of tomatoes that's out there. Um, when you look at some of the gardening catalogs, in fact, I saw one not too long ago that went over three pages of fine print of just different tomatoes. So choose what you like best, try different ones, and it's exciting to grow all of them. Just a little aside, I will be talking about some of the problems in tomatoes. And here you can see just probably a little start of um, blossom end rot. So we will be talking about some of that and hopefully also give you some hints as to how you can avoid that. So um, moving on from there, I hope. There we go. Um, just as Darby said, I'm Dorothy Kieser. I'm a certified master gardener with the Vancouver Island Master Gardeners Association. And we do these talks in partnership with the Vancouver Island Regional Library, which is a really lovely way of uh, getting assorted gardening knowledge out to the public. And as far as the information is concerned, we try and make it as science-based and accurate as best we can. But if we goof, and that can happen, then any use of that information is at the sole discretion, responsibility, and liability of you as the user. So the main thing I really want to talk about is to impress on you um, that tomatoes are a very warm weather crop. And yes, we can grow them in our climate here. And I don't know where most of you come from, but if you're on the East Coast of Vancouver Island and you look out your window today, then you think we'd never be able to grow tomatoes. But in the meantime, from where they originated um, years ago, um, where they originated years ago, then uh, you can see that they have been bred quite a bit to, um, to allow them being grown in our area. So really keep in mind that these are tropical plants and, uh, and they do grow best at a temperature of somewhere between 21 and 25 degrees. And that's true not only for the seed starting, hang on for one second, there's something happening that I can't control, so hang on. So now we'll just play the elevator music. Can you try the following? Yeah, I, I in a seminar I can't talk to you. Oh. Dorothy, you'll have to unmute yourself. I just muted you. There we go. So let's start again. Um, we really want to impress on you um, that these are warm weather crops. So whether you start the seeds for yourself or whether you buy transplants and put them out, keep in mind that they need to be warm enough to, uh, to be comfortable. So on this chart, you can see that usually in our climate, we can back calculate from when it's warm enough in the soil to be at least 15 degrees, preferably 21 or even a bit more, i.e. comfortably warm in the soil, we back calculate when we want to start the seeds. And so since we know that it takes roughly eight weeks for those seeds to get into little seedlings and then to be ready to be outplanted. So if you think you can plant your tomatoes in the middle of May, then eight weeks prior makes it the middle of March. It's very tempting. I know it's very tempting to think you can start them already in February and then you can put them out and then you're earlier. And it's so lovely. It's very hard sometimes, especially after winter to keep that green thumb under control and, to, and not start them too early. But um, anyway, uh, do keep in mind that you're not ahead by uh, getting too much of a jump on it because your tomatoes Plant, little plants will be too leggy. They don't have the right conditions 
for our planting. So start your seeds, really not before the middle of March in our climate, outplant them the middle of May and we'll get into all of that. And then you'll be harvesting somewhere from the end of July, maybe even a bit earlier, well into September. And if we have a late fall, even later than that. So, so that's one of the key take home messages that I want to, uh, to share here. So let's go on to the seeding actually. That of course is very key if you want to start your own plants. And uh, I am very fond of starting my seeds in actual seed starting, commercial seed starting mixture. And why do I say that? The commercial seed starting mixture is just the right um, formulation to keep the right moisture level without having the um, soil soaking and the right nutrient level and the right composition. So I, as I say, I really, and it's sterile. So you have less trouble with damping off and other uh, fungus problems and whatnot. So when you look at those little seed trays and you can either buy those seed trays or you can use the little tomato, uh, not tomato, the little mushroom containers that you get in, in most of the stores that uh, work very well for the few tomato plants that you want to start, make sure they have a hole in the bottom though so they can drain. And then it's very important to space the seeds appropriately, because if you have them too close together, they don't have enough room to develop properly. They don't get enough nutrition. Um, when you have to transplant them, you do too much trouble, uh, damage to the roots. And so make sure that you give them enough space. And when I talk about enough space, I'm really talking about at least an inch in between. And that's what you see here, roughly an inch in between each seed, and yes, it says tomato pepper, but it doesn't matter whether you're starting tomatoes or peppers or tomato peppers. Um, it's the rule of thumb is the same. The other rule of thumb is once you've gotten the seeds onto the soil, then you put about twice the thickness of the seed of soil on top of it and then pat it down ever so lightly and then water it. Because as you know, the seeds stay fairly dormant so long as they dry, but the moisture will, speaking anthropomorphically, the moisture will wake them up and get them to start germinating. And then what do seeds need? Well, initially they only need warmth and they do need that warmth that I've already referred to. And so you can have them anywhere, anywhere where it's nice and toasty warm until they start to germinate. And then of course they need the warmth, although they don't need quite as much warmth, but they need the warmth and they need the light. So for my own setup, this is my home setup. You can see I have the heat mat under here and then I have an overhead light, which you can't see, but, uh, but it is formulated. It's the full spectrum sunlight formulation. And, uh, and the plants do really quite well. And then the watering is absolutely critical. You want to keep it in even moisture. And my comparison, just to give you a feel for what that moisture level should be, is about the moisture that you would get in a wrung out, well wrung out dish rag. So it shouldn't be soaking, it shouldn't be very dry, so wrung out. And for me to make it easy, I love these little, I get them from Lee Valley, but I'm sure other garden stores have them too. The, you can buy these little tops that have a very fine spray. It fits onto any size pop bottle. And then you can just very finely spray those little seedlings and get that moisture level just the way you want it. And then before too long, you will actually have a little plant. Some people actually start the seed right in the individual pots. That works perfectly well too. But what's wrong with this picture? Well, there's a couple of things that I would say is not ideal about this little seedling. First of all, it's looking fairly yellow. And that means it hasn't had enough light. It's also really looking towards the window here. So it's desperate to get some more light. So, and it probably hasn't had quite the right uh, moisture level because you see some of the dead leaf material here. So this plant would need more real sunlight, which of course <clears throat> at this time of the year, you can't get indoors and you certainly can't set it outdoors. 
So if you want to start your own seeds, make sure you have that real grow light that allows the plant to, to really thrive. Having said that, um, and of course the window, especially as your seeds starting, the windowsill is not the warmest place in the house. And so that's not the ideal place to start the seeds either. So heat, heat and light is critical to get a really nice, good looking seedling. But now let's assume that this was a good looking seedling and you're ready to outplant it. And so what I would do is first of all, I would of course have the appropriate spot. And the appropriate spot is somewhere where it's again, warm, where you get full sunlight. And when I say full sunlight, the very minimum you want for tomatoes is at least six hours a day. It's far better if you can get eight hours or even more uh, sunlight. And, uh, and then you get the best, ripest, tastiest tomatoes. So pick your spot with good soil, good, well-drained, fertile soil. And then um, how do you plant them? Well, you plant them fairly deep. So if I were to use this little tomato seedling, I would dig my hole so that the soil level eventually ends up right about here. So these leaves will be just above soil level, but all this stem part would be underground. And the reason I'm saying that is pretty soon roots will form along the stem where it's in the soil. And so you get a much sturdier, healthier plant that can take up more nutrients and, um, and just be a, a better plant. But um, having said that, you also want to make sure that that planting hole has the appropriate nutrients in it. So what I like to do is when I dig my planting hole, I put in probably three or four tablespoons, heap tablespoons of an organic all-purpose fertilizer. And my personal favorite happens to be Gaia Green 444, but I'm sure there's lots of others that are equally suitable. The other thing I like to put into my planting hole is a couple of tablespoons of finely crushed eggshell. And that'll be a nice uh, calcium supply for that tomato plant. So with that, I can start thinking about actually putting my tomatoes out. And this is how it looks in Nanaimo today. This is at the Bebbin Learning Gardens. But as I'm thinking about putting my tomatoes out, and I've thought about where I want to put my tomatoes, I, um, I want to know how I can support my tomatoes. Now, this doesn't show you very much, so I'll give you a little schematic of how I want that tomato trellis to actually look. As you know, if, and we'll get into uh, terminology in a little bit, but if you grow some of the larger tomatoes, then you know that you need to support them. And most tomato cages are perfectly okay for the smaller type of tomatoes, but for the, and especially um, some of the, the uh, little bush tomatoes work very well in tomato cages. But ideally for the bigger tomatoes, you want something that's nice and sturdy. And so here's the construct that I erect in my own garden. So I have uprights, that are about five and a half feet above ground. And then of course I have to have some for stability underground. So in total, my uprights are probably close to seven feet long. Six and a half is probably enough. So I have these uprights and basically I want to have as many uprights as I want to have plants. And so in my garden that takes up a fair bit because I usually have oh, somewhere around 20 different varieties of tomatoes. So you construct your uprights and then you construct the cross members to which you actually tie those tomatoes. And they can be fairly thin, but they need to be sturdy enough so that they can, the tomatoes can nicely be tied to them. And you space those uprights at about a foot apart. That's a nice distance that lets the tomato grow and you don't have to have too much work in terms of tying it up. Um, did I already say you want about three feet between, between uprights so that the tomatoes have enough space? 
So you construct this lovely trellis. And then the other thing you want to do is have an irrigation, whoops, let's go back, um, have an irrigation pipe that runs at least on one side of your trellis and possibly even on both sides of the trellis. And we'll go into watering in a little bit, um, but keep in mind that, that irrigation at ground level is really important. And then you probably want to cover your irrigation pipe so you don't have too much moisture loss. So on top of my irrigation pipe, I put a fair bit of mulch and you can choose what kind of mulch you want. Um, straw is good, even old leaves from the previous season are good. Any kind of organic mulch that, uh, that you have or can easily access is perfectly good to cover that irrigation pipe. So that's, then once you have that all up, the soil is nice and warm, you're ready to plant your tomatoes. And this is how it looks um, at our first try at some of this construct and tomatoes. And you can see we have three different plants here. So it's about a three, four foot, in this case, raised bed at the Bevan Learning Gardens here in Nanaimo. And you can see nice fruit set amongst these diff different plants. Um, it's not an ideal way at this point because um, first of all, it's too dense and we'll get into density in a minute when we talk about some of the problems. Um, the other thing is you can see the spaghetti irrigation pipe on this side and you can see the spaghetti irrigation pipe on that side. And that's very good because it uh, we're working hard to keep that nice even moisture but what's missing is the mulch to keep it from evaporating more quickly than you absolutely uh, need to have the water loss. You can also see that there's some underplanting. Here's a bit of basil, which of course is wonderful with tomatoes and some pollinator plants, in this case, marigolds. But as I say, what's, what's uh, less than ideal is how dense the plants are. But otherwise, it's doing it's doing really pretty good. So a few thoughts on planting. The first of all is, of course, crop rotation. And uh, why would you want to rotate the crops? Well, there's a number of viruses and a number of nematodes and other things that if you plant the uh, tomatoes each year um, in the same spot would really multiply and be hard on your crop. So you want to rotate your crop. Now, having said that, it's not always easy to rotate in a small garden because your sun, uh, best sunspots may only be in a certain spot. I have that problem myself that my garden is a bit sloped. I have a few shade trees around, so I can't quite um, rotate as nicely as one might find ideal. So what can you do instead? Well, you can really rotate the soil. If you can't rotate the crop, you can rotate the soil. And I was talking earlier about, um, you know, digging a nice big planting hole. Well, if you make that planting hole a bit bigger and then put in good different soil, new soil, um, compost and, and other good soil, then you might not be rotating the crop, but you're certainly rotating soil and you're accomplishing exactly the same sort of thing. So I have a friend who has just one ideal spot for growing tomatoes, and uh, and that's what she does. She rotates the soil and she produces the most fantastic crop. The other thing in terms of planting is, as we all know, it takes a while for the tomatoes to be really good size. So you don't want to waste any garden space. So what can you do? You can underplant. So early crops like lettuce, for instance, or even radishes, or other relatively small crops that stay low down are a perfect companion in the same bed, just between the tomatoes that uh, grow up. So you don't have to waste any garden space, choose a crop that's, um, that's suitable for underplanting. And you can also underplant with pollinator plants. I'm particularly fond of alyssum because it's excellent for the 
for pollinators, but it's also excellent for some of the predatory wasps and whatnot that get their nectar from these small flowers and that can um, really deal with a lot of a lot of the uh, problems that you might encounter with various uh, pests like aphids and you name it. So now we get into a less wonderful subject and that is problems with tomatoes. Well, we're all so proud of our tomatoes, but there's a goodly number of things that can just plain go wrong. And splitting of the fruit, which makes it less sightly and less lasting and whatnot, is certainly one of the problems. So how does that splitting come along? Well, if you, and here's my little spiel about making sure that you have even watering, and that is true not just for splitting, but for some of the other things too. If you have a period where it's reasonably dry, um, the tomato forms the fruit, it forms a fairly um, solid skin, and then all of a sudden you decide, oh, I haven't watered my tomatoes enough, I better get right out there and do it, and you give it a whole lot of water and really um, soak it nicely and whatnot. And then the water goes into the plant and where does it go? It, the tomato can't really expand the skin, so it splits. So that's uh, my spiel about even watering, but there's more to the even watering than that, as we'll see on the next slide. And that's a problem that so many of us encounter. Um, in, it's called blossom end rot. And what it is, is that the tomato here does not get all the nutrients it needs. And that primarily it does not get the calcium that it needs to form properly. And then pretty soon you ha then have the lack of calcium problem or here the lack of calcium problem. And then secondary invader invaders like fungus and whatnot set in and it becomes unsightly and pretty soon it becomes kind of disgusting. And so people say, oh, there wasn't enough calcium in my soil. Well, that's possible, but chances are that you have plenty of calcium in your soil, especially if you put the eggshells in that I was talking about, or if you put some lime in at the beginning of the season, um, all of these things would supply calcium to the fruit. But what happens, if you have that uneven watering that I was talking about a minute ago, then the calcium actually cannot be transported from the root system into the fruit. And so it's not that the soil lacks the calcium. Yes, the fruit lacks the calcium, but it's because it wasn't soluble and it wasn't able to get to the fruit. So absolutely key that you keep that watering nice and even. They would avoid all kinds of problems, including that. The other fruit problem that we've encountered quite a bit in the last few years, and that's lack of pollination. And so we don't have the fruit set that you want to accomplish because the reason being that um, when the temperatures, outside temperatures go above about 30, 31 degrees, the pollen becomes sterile. So there was a blossom there but the, didn't produce any pollen or it didn't produce any viable pollen. So the fruit couldn't, or the blossom couldn't get pollinated and no fruit could be set. That's not the end of the world because as soon as the heat dome is over, new blossoms will form, um, regular fertile pollen will be available and you can go on from there, but you will have lost several days of uh, very nice possibility of a nice fruit set. Um, let's see what the next slide, no, I'll just go back a couple of slides again. There. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about heat because the heat not only can uh, cause the lack of fruit, but it can also cause deformed fruit, which we see more of as we're having hotter weather. And it can cause fruit that's much less tasty and why is it much less tasty if you encounter that? Again, um, it's so hot that the fruit isn't getting enough or the whole plant isn't getting enough water. So it shuts down its breathing pores, its stomata, to conserve water from the for the leaves and for the fruit. And so when you shut down the 
the breathing apparatus or the ability to to uh, get oxygen in and to, and have the plant um, grow properly, then of course it will use up its own sugars and the uh, taste of the new to of the tomatoes in the under those circumstances will be much less um, than you would have if they could um, if it wasn't so hot and they didn't have to cut shut down their breathing holes. And of course, we've all seen and heard of blight. There's various blights, but really the worst one, and they look all quite similar. It's a question of timing. They're all caused by a fungus. And it looks, the leaves go, um, have these patches of fungus. The stem gets brown patches of fungus. And pretty soon that uh, plant is basically uh, a goner. What can you do? Um, again, some of it is preventable in terms of uh, controlling your water. And that's why I was talking earlier about making sure that you're watering um, just in the soil. The fungus really gets a foothold if the leaves stay wet. And so if, um, if, the, if you have a lot of rain, then of course the leaves stay wet. We haven't had that problem here in the east coast of Vancouver Island recently, but um, it's also a question of the gardener having either an overhead sprinkler system or watering the leaves very much. If, if you can avoid watering the leaves, you will have much less problem with the Phytophthora um, blight than if you have the leaves wet. So if you must water by hand, make sure you keep the leaves as dry as possible and only water first thing in the morning so that the leaves dry off as quickly as possible. Of course, the other thing that you can do is to grow your tomatoes either in a greenhouse or in a tunnel or some other cover to keep the rain off and have the um, hoses. But having said that, if it's really moist outside, then you can, in a tunnel, if you don't have enough air circulation, then you can have water droplets actually fall from the tunnel onto the leaves and then without air circulation, you pretty soon um, have fairly wet leaves and you really haven't accomplished what you're hoping to accomplish. So if you can keep the leaves dry um, and give them a nice sunny spot, your chances of having phytophthora blight is much less than uh, if you just had them um, had wet leaves. A few other things that I wanted to talk about. This is an excellent book that's in your handout um, in terms of natural insect and disease control. And they, it lists the various fruit and things that you want to grow um, by the type of fruit. And it goes into all kinds of problems and it starts right at seedlings. So if you're growing your own seedlings and all of a sudden the seedlings fall over, what happened? Well, the soil, the stem rather, rotted at the soil line. And that's called damping off. And it's really can be prevented or at least reduced due to, um, it occurs when you have a lack of air circulation, when you have uh, overwatered your soil. And um, so any seedling that keels over like that, of course, is um, not going to be a thriving seedling. The other thing that you might see if you're growing your seedlings, especially if you don't have a nice heat mat, is um, that the underside of the leaves really turn kind of purpley as though the plant was kind of shivering. And that's a lack of phosphorus in the leaves. And similar to the calcium that I was talking about in the blossom end rot, that lack of phosphorus is, um, not because there isn't enough phosphorus in the soil, or that's a very unlikely condition anyway, but rather that uh, the plant can't take it up because of the cold. And as soon as you give it a warmer condition, the um, that phosphorus uptake will continue and the leaves will turn a normal color again. So um, make sure that your plants are nice and warm and you will not have to worry about that. Sometimes the seedlings actually get clipped off at the soil 
level and rather than just falling over. And then you better look for cutworms that uh, come up, oftentimes just come out at night so that you don't see them. And uh, so you need to actually be on the lookout for them if you have seedlings that look cut off. But if you're using sterile um, seed starting soil, that's not a problem that you're likely to encounter. And then there's all kinds of um, problems in terms of yellow leaves. Yellow leaves oftentimes indicate that there's not enough nitrogen. So give it a little boost with a fertilizer tea, a compost tea or a seaweed tea or one of those um, so that uh, you, they get a little bit more nitrogen. But having said that, if you give it too much nitrogen, and especially once you've set the fruit, uh, the plants out into the garden, if you give it too much nitrogen, you get a lush green growth because that's where the nitrogen acts primarily is in the leaf formation and the growth, but you don't get enough fruit set. So you have to balance that uh, amount of nitrogen um, with not overdoing it and not underdoing it because otherwise, or the other um, thing, if you just get a lot of green growth, then it may be a, a lack of sunshine. So that's primarily the issue of, uh, of problems. The tomato hornworm, people get all excited about, but in our area here on Vancouver Island, that's actually not so much of a problem, but I just left the slide in there because it's an impressive looking beast. That's the caterpillar here, very ugly looking, and it certainly eats a tremendous amount of foliage. If you were to have something like that here, you see a plant that's almost defoliated and that's the adult of that tomato hornworm so what you can do is uh, look carefully especially at night and to make sure that you get rid of all those hornworms in my own garden one of the things that i have to really look out for is making sure that i tie my tomatoes up sufficiently because wire worms are in the soil and they feed, um, they overwinter in the soil in uh, volunteer potatoes that didn't get harvested. And then they start eating the um, roots of various plants. But anyway, they're always in the soil. And if a tomato rests on the ground because you haven't tied it up enough, then lo and behold, those wire worms actually get into the tomato. This was one that I... Uh, noticed last summer and you can see this Gordian knot of um, wireworms here and you see wireworms there and there and uh, obviously that's not a tomato that's particularly attractive on your sandwich or in your tomato sauce. Having moved from the problem areas um, and I'm sure other of you will come and ask some questions about problems they've encountered and hopefully we can find some answers for you. Let's go on to seed saving. And, uh, and I am a great seed saver because I really like the heritage tomatoes and I'll do definitions of heritage and otherwise in a minute. But um, if I'm wanting to save seed, I take a nice piece of white um, napkin and I write on it which seed I want to save because next year I wouldn't know one seed from another if I didn't write it on there in the first place. So I take the ripest, nicest, juiciest tomato and as I'm slicing it up for a sandwich, I take out some of the seeds. And the seeds have enough moisture and sort of gluey uh, gum on them to nicely stick to that paper. And then I space them just the way I would space them as if I wanted to plant them on the paper, i.e. at least an inch apart. And then next, and then I dry them out, I put them into a Ziploc, I put them in a cool, dry place, and I'm ready for next year. And then next year I come along with a pair of scissors and I cut out a strip and I can just lay it on my seed starting soil, put a little bit of soil on top of it, and I have this beautiful row of homegrown, or well, I mean, hopefully they germinate, but of seeds that will make a nice new Slava tomato. Slava is a nice mid-sized tomato. Um, 
for next year. And so I can very readily save my seeds and uh, and be off to the races for the following year. Yes, let's talk a little bit about terminology for a minute here. Earlier I was saying about how the big tomatoes um, need those trellises and how the bush tomatoes are a little bit smaller and probably do within a tomato cage. So let's, it took me a long time to figure out when people came to, uh, to the gardens to buy their tomato seedlings, what they were actually talking about. Some people would say, I want a bush tomato. Some people would say, I want a determinate tomato. Some people would say, I want a vine tomato, or they would say, I want an indeterminate tomato. Well, actually, bush and determinate is the same thing. Vine and indeterminate is the same thing. So what am I talking about? A bush tomato is a tomato that forms a bush. And once it's formed its bush, it basically stops growing and just makes tomatoes. A vine tomato, on the other hand, keeps on growing. And it, if the conditions were right, which of course in our climate, they freeze before all too long. Um, but if you had a nice heated greenhouse, for instance, like a commercial greenhouse or whatever, that vine would go for a long time. And so it's indeterminate. It doesn't stop growing until the climatic conditions are such that it's no longer viable. So a bush tomato generally is a little bit earlier it, because it doesn't put as much effort into the growing. And, and it, the vine tomatoes make the bigger, juicier fruit. So it really depends what you want. Consequently, also, if you want to grow things in containers, then your bush tomato is a far better bet than a vine tomato. But if you have a nice big garden space, then, and you want big juicy tomatoes, then go for the vine tomatoes. So that's a little bit on that. The other term that I wanted to mention to you is parthenocarpic. It's a long word, and what does it really mean? It means that the tomatoes can form fruit without being pollinated. Obviously they need to have a blossom, but it doesn't need to have any ripe pollen. So the very earliest tomatoes that you can get because they don't have to develop that ripe pollen are the parthenocarpic varieties. And what are parthenocarpic varieties? Well, what we get in our area, what does really well, are Oregon Spring for a mid-sized tomato, or Silets, also a very nice mid-sized tomato. There's also some parthenocarpic um, to, um, cherry tomatoes like Honey Drop. So look for those if you want the earliest tomatoes. And then of course, later on in the season, the pollen becomes ripe and then you, you can grow regular fertilized um, tomatoes and that's the ones you could save seeds from if you were so inclined but obviously the first parthenocarpic um, varieties or fruit rather are not good for seed saving because they don't have the full genetic complement. The other term I wanted to go into because there's all kinds of questions is the F1 hybrids versus open pollinated. Open pollinated equals heritage or heirloom tomatoes. That's all the same sort of thing. Those are the ones that you can save seed from and expect to have the same type of tomato, more or less anyway, um, year after year after year. So those might be the heirlooms that you've gotten from your grandmother who's already grown them from seeds that she illegally imported from various places in Europe. And so they're absolutely wonderful tomatoes. But there's absolutely not, nothing wrong with hybrid tomatoes either. The F1 actually stands for the first generation, the first children. That's where the F comes from, the first children generation. And uh, they have some real advantages, or put it this way, they can have some real advantages. And just to il illustrate here, um, you have one type of tomato and another type of tomato and they form a tomato that could look quite significantly different from either one of the parental generations or per parent um, fruit. 
if um, and the growers have established that for a long time, if they cross these two varieties, you are likely to get a nice orange tomato that's fairly disease resistant, that can grow very well, um, and maybe have, from a commercial standpoint, have a much rougher skin, not rougher, but tougher skin. And so from a commercial standpoint, it's much more shippable. So it can have all kinds of advantages. And those have been found out over years of crossing different types to see what you can come up with. To, up with. But the open pollinated or heirloom tomatoes are just stable within themselves and you get the same crop year after year. And, uh, but they're not as hardy in terms of the thick skin. They're maybe more prone to various fungus diseases and things. So you have to try that out yourself. Either one is perfectly good, um, but it's nice to think that we have tomatoes that our grandparents already tasted as well. So as I say, and those are the only ones you can save seeds from if you want to have a stable crop. And with that, I just want to show you some of the tomatoes that I particularly like. And that is uh, a variety here that's called black cherry. And obviously it's a cherry tomato that um, is particularly tasty. And that's a small oblong, as you can see, oblong uh, fruit. The most prolific tomato that I can think of in my garden is the Gardener's Delight, which is about the size of a mandarin orange. Very prolific, as you can see here, lots of clusters. If you want a mid-sized red tomato, my favorite is Mortgage Lifter. And uh, if you want a big yellow tomato that's particularly sweet, low acid for those people who have trouble, Hawaiian pineapple is lovely. But when you actually go to the internet and see what is considered the most flavorful tomatoes, everybody will say Brandywine. And Brandywine is a lovely tomato. It just doesn't do particularly well in my garden. So I had to choose other varieties. And here, just to give you a size comparison, this is a tomato called One Pound. This one is more purple, called Cherokee Purple. This one is a striped Roma, and then two little hanging basket ones. And for those of you who only have patios, or for those people who have no fences and the deer eat their tomatoes, I would suggest go for the hanging basket tomatoes. Very prolific, as you can see, um, tons of fruit, and then one plant in a normal size hanging basket will give you pounds and pounds of tomatoes. So it's really up to you what you want to uh, accomplish, what your family likes in terms of color. My family doesn't like anything but red tomatoes. So it's, it's up to you, but do try different varieties because they're so different, A, in terms of how vigorous they are, B, in terms of their taste and also looks. I enjoy the looks of the different tomatoes. And now as I'm coming to the end, um, I just wanted to show you a surprise. And that is homegrown tomatoes in the winter. Now these are not my own, but they're tomatoes from a friend of mine. And it's a variety called Mystery Keeper. And here you see the same basket in November last year and in January this year. So she's obviously eaten quite a few. The green ones still ripen inside the basket. And of course, they're not summer tomatoes. They don't have that fabulous summer taste that you expect in a tomato, but they're your homegrown tomatoes. So if you can give them a little bit of shelter, like I grow some in my unheated greenhouse, um, they're just fun to have. And you can even have cherry tomatoes that uh, that last well into uh, the next season. So if you have that ability, give it a go just for the fun of it and sh showing off to your friends. And with that, I um, um, you heard earlier that I'm a volunteer at the Bevan Learning Gardens here in Nanaimo, and we grow roughly 25 different varieties of heirloom tomatoes. So if you don't want to start your own, that's a good place. But for those of you who are not in the Nanaimo area, I also wanted you to have that web address because there's a list of tomatoes 
that you might want to consider with a real clear description of taste, size, color. And so it's worthwhile looking at that website just because of the description of the different tomatoes. With that, I just the references and uh, Darby has sent those out to you, so I won't go into anything extra for that. And just showing off before the questions, here's one of my one pound tomatoes. And as you can see on the uh, screen there, it weighed 498 grams and I was very proud of it. And with that, I'll stop and answer any questions. That's amazing, Dorothy. <laughs> uh, we've got quite a few questions. Um, this question was asked when you were talking about starting tomatoes. Um, can I put them in an egg carton? Um, and Joe, please chime in anytime that uh, I come to the end of my rope. But egg cartons do not have a whole lot of soil in them. So of course you could start them in the egg cartons, but then very soon, by the time you get the first true leaves, I would suggest they need to go into a bigger pot because there's just not enough nutrients in the soil to uh, sustain that plant for any further length of time. Joe, you're still muted. And there. the other good point, Dorothy, that you brought up about that is uh, if there's only a little bit of soil, you're going to be damaging some very delicate roots when you try to transplant. And yeah, you had so, met, so yeah, you mentioned that. As I say, if you if and the other thing is soil depth. Um, you should have soil depth of, I would say, a minimum, and again, Joe, a minimum of two inches to uh, give the roots a proper mm, depth level to uh, to get a good start and then before too long i would transplant them from the two inch depth to about oh i'm trying to see what this is four inches is probably good in the four inch pots they can go out oh what remind me whether i talked about hardening off i don't think i did did not let me just no. let no. me just uh, rectify that so as I'm getting ready to set my plants outside, um, I want to be sure that they have the best start possible. And that is, we don't want any sunburn to happen. And um, the sunburn, think of yourself, if you're, you've been in the winter indoors all the time and all of a sudden you go to Hawaii and you sit on the beach, what would happen? You would burn to a crisp. Well, the similar thing happens to plants that have been grown indoors and have not had access to real sunlight. And so what you want to do is you want to acclimatize them. You want that plant to have a chance to form a thicker cuticle layer and uh, add to, the chlorophyll, to its chlorophyll um, component so that it can more readily deal with the sunlight. And so what you want to do is on a nice warm sunny day, you take your baby uh, tomato, your seedling, and you set it outside. And I would say four hours is plenty. And that gives it a chance to stabilize that cuticle. And the next day you do that again. And you probably do that for three or four or five days. Um, if you want to be really diligent over a week. And each day you do it for a little bit longer. And not only does that strengthen the cuticle and make the sunburn less of a problem, it also strengthens the roots because um, it gets buffeted by a bit of a breeze and it knows, oh, I better make some more roots. And so it'll have a much better root system and be sun protected if you do that proper hardening off step. Great. Uh, we had a another, um, some more questions from that sort of um, step in the process. There was a question from Valerie. What mechanism do you use for crushing your eggshells finely? Uh, do you do it at the level of a powder, by smashing a bag with a hammer, or? <laughs> or, well, mm -hmm. I actually went to the hospital auxiliary store and I bought myself an old coffee grinder or used coffee grinder. And so I put them through the coffee grinder and it makes it almost powdery, not quite, but uh, but a, a, a used coffee grinder from your hospital auxiliary store or some other place is a wonderful way to crush eggshells. 
So powder is something uh, close to powder is the ideal that we're aiming for. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. So that, that makes the uptake easy. So the hammer probably... Too much good. trouble. Too much <laughs> trouble. And you might get a blue thumb. <laughs> <laughs> a food processor might do it. Might. Might. Yeah, I don't have one of those. Is yeah, we, one of the no problems. Coffee you, grinders left at the thrift store. Yeah, but if you have a food processor or an austerizer, um, the shells are very tough. Um, and they will dull the blades. Okay. Dorothy's Dorothy's uh, suggestion about the coffee, the old coffee grinder, um, uh, that's that's the one that'll do do the job without ruining the blades of your uh, food processor. That's yeah, I I'm actually missing. throw them into a I throw them into a, a ice cream container or whatnot to dry them out as I'm using them, and then at some point when the ice cream container gets full, then I crush them. So that it's easier to put them into the coffee grinder and then I go ahead and grind them up. And you don't bake them. I don't. You I don't just let them to. air dry. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you for answering my questions and Valerie's about that. Um, okay, from the same era in the presentation about transplanting, what amount of Gaia Green 444 per plant? You're talking about digging the hole and putting a few tablespoons in. That's correct. I I mean, the Gaia Green people, of course, would like you to, to uh, do even more. They, they talk about half a cup, but I'm perfectly mm -hmm. happy to do about three tablespoons or thereabouts. And, um, and if you see my cat appear, she's there. Um, anyway, so, so three tablespoons, four tablespoons is plenty. And then somewhere along the season, when you start fruit set, you might want to give the tomatoes a drink of compost tea or seaweed tea or something like that to add to the nutritional end of things. But I find in my own garden where I use compost uh, a fair bit, I don't actually have to do a whole lot of extra. And when, when you were putting the Gaia Green in, in the hole too, you were doing a few tablespoons of your coffee grinder eggshell. Yes. And uh, the other thing I should have said, um, you don't want to expose the roots directly to that. So as you're digging your hole and putting your stuff in, mix it in with some of the soil. So it's, I mean, yes, it's organic and yes, it's not likely to burn, but I like to distribute it a bit around the hole anyway. So, so dig in the hole a little bit and, uh, and distribute it. Great. Okay, so I think we just, you just talked about this with the compost tea and things. Um, Connie was asking, do you fertilize again throughout the plant's growing time after the fruit starts to form? Yes. And uh, speaking of fruit forming, um, the other thing I should have mentioned earlier in terms of the vine tomatoes is around about August, I mean, they would still be setting fruit until it just got too cold and they can't do it anymore but you want your fruit to really ripen fully so at the end of towards the end of August I cut off any tendrils that are still having blossoms on them or even tiny immature fruit so I trim those off so that the goodness so to speak goes into the tomatoes that are already a bit bigger and uh, want to ripen them fully and I cut down on the watering again that gives them the signal I better get those fruit ripened and juicy um, so that um, that uh, the winter doesn't come before before uh, time's over. So s reduce the watering and cut off any of those long tendrils on your vine tomatoes. And that's again, I mean, anything that goes above my five and a half foot, six foot um, trellis just rigorously gets cut off. Excellent. Um... There was one about the trellis in here that I'm not seeing. Yes, page. wanted to know what the materials were because they had trouble um, with uh, strong enough materials that her poles kept falling over. Yes, there it is. I mean, what what would people use as bean poles? Uh, if you're growing pole beans, that's the same kind of uprights that I would use. The bean poles just need to be a bit taller than the tomato poles but the principle is the same so i have tomato poles that are 
oh, I'm I'm looking probably about two inches in diameter. And the cross members can be as small as oh three quarters of an inch. And I apologize for not being metric, but there we are. <laughs> There's and a the, question here from somebody other, about tomato cages. Oh, sorry, just sorry, Richard. The other part of the person's question is what you use to take um, those pieces together, the two inches and then the three quarters. Mm -hmm. Actually, I only use string. I tie them on and that seems to be perfectly good. But speaking of tying on, that's also something I didn't mention is uh, make sure that the string that you use for tying on the tomatoes is thick enough. Because I found over the years that if I used string that was too fine um, and then I had a heavy set of tomatoes, they would actually cut off the uh, the vines. And so it's important that you have a nice thick twine or maybe some, um, what's the, the ribbon that people use to mark stuff, anything like that, that isn't a problem with um, with cutting too much into the stems. Okay, so the two inches, the three quarters, and some pretty hefty twine. Scoop, yeah, skookum twine. Mm -hmm. twine. <laughs> Richard, sorry, keep going there. Uh, somebody's asking about tomato cages also. I've not used tomato cages when I planted them in the ground, but in pots, I've always used tomato cages because I've grown my tomatoes in a greenhouse. So I need some sort of support and I can't really afford a trellis. So what I've done is I've used one tomato cage as the bottom and then flip another one on the top and then tie wrap them together. So it produces like a, a column, basically. That and would work. Yeah, it the works quite I... well for indeterminate or uh, vine. Yeah. yeah, the other thing I do in my greenhouse, actually, because I don't make a trellis in my greenhouse either, is I uh, tie some string to the cross rafters and then tie those strings into the ground on a little peg and then just mm -hmm. wind the tomatoes around there. Yeah. Okay. So we've got some um, questions about temperatures for um, starting tomatoes. Yes. Uh, one says, if my indoor kitchen room temperature ranges from 21 to 22 degrees, maybe 20 if the door is open, do I still need a heat mat or is it that just for homes that keep a yes. cooler house? Yes. Well, if you really don't go too far down at night, I mean, a lot of people turn their temperature down at night and then, you know, they might go as low as 16. That's still OK. Um, not so much for the seeds starting. Uh, the seeds themselves like to be particularly toasty warm until they've germinated. Once they've germinated, then they can take slightly lower temperatures. And those temperatures that you just mentioned are perfectly good for that. Um, but so you don't necessarily need a heat mat once they're germinated, but make sure that during the germination period, they're at least at 20. And you may find that uh, because the seeds don't care how warm the air is in your house. They care about how warm the soil is. Oh, so, so if the, if the best soil uh, temperature, like on your seed mats is 70 degrees, sorry, Fahrenheit, I'm like Dorothy, um, Take a thermometer and see how warm that soil is. You might be surprised how cool it is. And if you're wondering, oh, my goodness, my my seeds are slow sprouting. And but my house is 72. It doesn't mean the soil that it's sitting on in that sunny window is 72. So it's very true. Yeah. So uh, I always I always opt um, and when I grew a lot more vegetables, I always opted for having seedling trays and that uh, or seedling mats. And that allowed me to actually I had a couple of mini greenhouses on the patio. Well, that surrounding air would get cool, but that soil would stay at 70 and I would have good, fast, reliable um, seed germination. Would Absolutely. you use the dome cover on them? Oh, they were, oh no, they were, they were covered, um, but they were outside. So they were more mm -hmm. subject to temperature changes, but right. the soil was an even temperature and it really showed. Most commercial seed mats nowadays actually come with a temperature probe. And so right. you stick that temperature probe into the soil and uh, then the heat mat adjusts it accordingly. 
Hey, um, so related to this, Whitney was asking um, about about seed mats and recommendations for how much heat seedlings need when they're germinated. Should I cycle the heat mat on and off instead of all the time? How do you transition from the, the seed mat into the hardening off phase? Okay. Um, the, the seed, if you have one of those heated seed mats and have one of the probes, then you don't have to worry about, um, you know, the fluctuation because the, the heat mat will be controlled by that temperature probe. So that's easy enough. Um, one of the things, um, what was I just going to say? Uh, anyway, the hardening, hardening off, um, you can, no, let me backtrack for a minute. With the setup that I showed you in terms of the um, light, um, the full spectrum light and the heat mat is tomatoes also, or any seedling also needs to sleep. So you need to adjust your light either by mechanically you turning it on in the morning and turning it off at night or um, having a timer on there because plants of the tomato variety and many others want about a 16 hour day length and an eight hour rest. So don't have that light on all the time thinking, oh, you can improve the process and they'll get more light and whatnot. They do need to sleep. And so make sure that you get about that 16 to eight ratio. Now the hardening off, um, yes, uh, I would suggest that at some point when your seedlings are getting tall enough and ready to outplant into the soil, you just turn your heat mat off. And by that time, your house is probably warm enough anyway, because the outside temperatures should be such that uh, the soil warms up, your house is warmed up, and then you don't have to worry about it anymore. Great. Uh, okay. Can I use seed starting soil from last year where the seedlings in the cells never germinated? Doesn't sound like a recipe for success, does it? No. no. <laughs> throw and it in the compost, throw it, throw the soil in the compost. Throw it in the compost or on your own outside beds in general and start anew. Um, what we found in, in the Bevan Learning Gardens is uh, if there was a real good sale on seed starting mix um, sometime after seed uh, starting season, so in about May, June, there'd be sales at the Walmarts and other places and you'd, we'd buy some. But then we found in the next season that despite the fact that they were supposed to be sterile and whatnot, we had all kinds of moss and fungus and whatnot growing in them. So again, those bags were ready for the compost rather than for using for seed mats, uh, seed starting. So I would suggest have a relatively new batch, good batch that uh, you want to start your seeds in rather than saving them, especially if you've already had bad success the first time around. Okay, excellent. Um, should hardening off be started with the seedlings coming out into the shade? That's an interesting question. I don't know what uh, Joe and Richard think about that, but all the seminars I've seen and all the reading I've done is, no, start it in the full sun, but don't overdo it. Yeah. That's what I've heard. Yeah, and and and, and and it's um, and it's morning sun. Um, you yeah. don't want to stick it out on the patio and leave it, you know, all day in the in the scorching heat. Um, it is well, the, it is a gentle process, but they do need sun. They're phototropic. Well, um, the other the um, other thing is you risk them drying out too if you've got them, you know, in a small pot. So, yes, I wouldn't be leaving them out in the the afternoon sun. Mm -hmm. Okay, but but yeah, just to do it's more a question of timing, but full sun so that they develop that appropriate cuti cuticle layer. These are great questions. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any problem with planting the seeds directly into a four inch part to pot to start with instead of so just no transplanting second set required? <laughs> no, there isn't anything wrong with that. Um, at, at least I don't I can't think of anything, but it uses a lot more expensive seed starting mix. Okay. 
uh, also the value of potting up with tomatoes, um, at least my experience has been, is uh, it can't it can't be overvalued. Um, the four inch pot is great and I've done that as well. Um, but using that smaller pot, as Dorothy says, don't waste that expensive potting soil. And then when you pot up, you have that option of getting the plant deep and de allowing it to um, develop that that root uh, that is so much keeps a healthy plant. And so uh, if you don't have time, put it in the four inch pot uh, from the beginning. But if you can, let yourself gradually pot them up and each time keeping that plant really deep in the soil and you'll get twice the, the health uh, and vigor out of the plant. And the other thing is every time you do move it up into a pot size, you can plant it deeper, which causes exactly. roots to grow up, up along the trunk. The other thing I might mention is potting up is a good idea too, because like you can disturb the soil and you can stimulate the roots to actually grow a little bit more. I'm not saying tearing them apart or anything like that, but disturbing them. What do you think, Dorothy? That, that sounds reasonable. Did you notice that Carrie had raised her hand, Darby? Um, I, I just saw a little note flick up and... Oh, uh, oh. <laughs> I don't know. Her hands we... down now, it looks like. Oh, well, then let's go back to the Q&As. Terry, if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A and we'll definitely get to you. Okay, mm -hmm. this one's from Deborah. It says, I've always grown my tomatoes in pots on a warm south-facing deck, but for the last couple of years, we've had a very hot week early in the season. And after mm -hmm. that, the plant stopped flowering. Is the heat causing this? Yep. If it was really warm enough, that's that uh, yeah. sterile pollen that I was talking about in terms of it was, especially on a south facing patio against the wall, it might well have been above the 30 degree mark. Pollen gets sterile, doesn't uh, allow for fruit set. And then of course you're not getting any tomatoes. Um, but if, if you then either move the pot to a cooler space it's where it's somewhere around anywhere between 20 and 28 degrees, then you should be having a nice fruit set again and uh, you can move on from there. Well, the and tomatoes are quite is... forgiving about heat days, which is that that day that's too hot for the pollen. Um, other other plants like tomatillas, if you get a heat day and it sterilizes the pollen and all your blossoms fall off, it's done for the season. Um, but, uh, um, but uh, tomatoes are, are really quite forgiving. They'll, they'll start again. They'll start the again. Other, yes, absolutely. Yeah. The other thing is you're, if you're got it up against the house or anything else, you're actually even increasing the heat quite a bit because of the reflected heat off the surfaces or like a concrete deck or anything like this. So it's, you know, you've got to keep that in mind too. Out in the middle of your yard, it might be 25 degrees up against the house. It might be 30. Mm -hmm. If this person, I'm not sure if they have like a, a house with ground or if they're in like a condo, but mm. um, do, would you have any suggestions for a, a condo dweller? If you're, um, getting if you're getting reflected light, uh, then, then put your thermometer next to your plants and see what kind of reflected heat you're getting. Um, that's uh, and then if you find it's getting too hot for them, then you put a shade cloth over them. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, and that will that will cut the heat um, by what the the term is. It cuts the heat by a climate zone, <laughs> yeah. so which is about ten degrees. Uh, the other and, thing that a friend of mine does is um, he grows a lot of tomatoes in pots. And he puts those pots on the little wheels that you can buy in various garden centers. And, roll them and then he moves them around and he may move them into a sunny spot, even a bigger plant, or he might move them more into the shade or whatever takes his fancy or what the tomato needs in terms <laughs> of where the climate is in his garden right at the moment. So if you are on a patio and you grow your tomatoes up against the wall, and you have one of those little wheelie things, you can just uh, move them away a bit more. And you can turn them around too, so they yes. get even sunlight all the way around them. 
Great. We have about four or five questions that are all along the lines of do you advocate pinching suckers, advice RE pruning, when in August do you cut the tendrils? Okay. Um, yes, removing suckers. Um, I hope I mentioned, I can not quite recall, I hope I mentioned a lot about air circulation. Air circulation is absolutely key, um, partly because you want the leaves to stay nice and dry. You want the other leaves to have access to the sun. You want fruit to have access to the sun. So remove the suckers as you see fit in terms of getting that good air circulation. And that's part of why I like the trellis is because the trellis is basically two-dimensional. And so if you take some of those suckers out, then you have that two-dimensional wall. And uh, and if you face it appropriately towards the sun, then the tomatoes get the sun, the leaves dry off quickly, um, and you can just space the suckers as you have room, keeping in mind that you want the wind to go through. So yes, you will have to remove some. And also then in terms of cutting off the, the top above the sort of five and a half foot level in August, yeah, I just cut it off where at the top of the trellis or wherever they happen to be at that particular time in the growing uh, season. Um, approximately when in August is one of the questions. Approximately, it kind of depends on the variety yeah. and uh, on how quickly they grew and so on. So I would say probably the latter half. I don't know whether Joe and Richard agree with that, but the latter half of August is when I would definitely cut them off. Even in a greenhouse, that's when I would cut mine off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I always let the tomato tell me. And like when I was growing uh, mystery keepers, they're a very, very late season tomato. And some of your uh, um, Italian sauce tomatoes are late season tomatoes. Let the, let the plant tell you when it's grown tall enough or too bushy or any of that, um, then um, you'll find that it's obvious when, when to prune them. Don't you decide, let the plant decide. But it's usually around August. <laughs> Don't over prune. Don't over prune because tomatoes also, not only the little guys that have been grown inside, but Oh, we're losing you, Dorothy. Dorothy is frozen. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, she's having she's having trouble getting to us. Well, Joe and Richard, can you um answer a question sure. about where to get a fruit seed itself bath? can suffer from sun? Oh, oh, she's back. Oh, do we, do yeah, we just it's, it's, yeah, not, not much I can seconds. do. <laughs> <laughs> so sun sun scald is a problem. Um, so keep some leaves on so to protect your fruit because where it gets sunburned, of course, it's a possibility for uh, secondary invaders like fungus and whatnot setting in. Sorry, Dorothy, you kind of cut out for about 10 seconds. We just got your last sentence. About sun scald? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so do prune... Do prune out those side suckers and whatnot, but don't overdo it because you do want a little bit of shade, especially on the sunny side, so that you avoid that sun scald, which not only is unsightly and not tasty, but also is a possibility of having secondary invaders. Okay, great. We have a few questions about banana peel or um, making a tea or putting a banana peel in directly in your, at the base of your tomatoes. It's a lovely thought. It gives some yeah. humus and whatnot. I don't think it is any magic ingredient per se, yeah. but, but yeah. if you put it underground, at least the slugs don't get it. That's and true. Rats. That's true. And if you want to feed your plant, feed it with the stuff that works as soon as it's in the ground. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, that's, that's really, you know, myself, I'd chop up the banana peel and put it in the compost. If I yes. need to fertilize my plant, then I combine compost and the extra fertilizer that almost every vegetable needs because we have turned them into great monster growers and there's no way our soils can keep up with it. 
um, and uh, give it the best, most whole food uh, with the supplement it needs. Same as with people. Right. <laughs> okay. That's right. Both of the questions also asked about water with the banana peel. So same deal. I don't know. It, it, I'm sure it doesn't do any harm. No. It, it must be um, a piece of advice that people get because two very different people asked. So, yeah, yeah. And someone asked about the worm castings. Can it substitute? Um, no. Um, the um, what worm castings do is make everything a superfood. <laughs> I guess that's would be the easiest way to put it. Um, worm worm castings um, creates um, the the web, the soil web, and and uh, it has it has tremendous uh, ability to give the plant vigor and all those things and whatever castings do um they do a hundred percent but they're meant to be combined with the other fertilizers and your compost just the way worms deal in nature in the soil um so you're wasting a lot of time effort and money to use only worm castings as a fertilizer substitute it's part of that great soup um or that that great stew of stuff that we uh um we feed our plants with but absolutely to me quite essential mm -hmm. do you do you think any other things about the worm casting issue dorothy no i i mean i people rave about it but i think it's uh, over overkill yeah, you you yeah. need that reasonable mix, and also you need the reasonable texture in the soil, and you don't necessarily get that from the worm castings. No, nev never. Um, for me, they were always um, a vital part of my compost mixtures, um, and uh, uh, because I always had more green slop than I had anything else, so I couldn't make a balanced compost. But boy, the worms sure sure did a number, and they were so fast. So uh, it was like it was, uh, and I noticed on the tests that I did, um, growing some potted vegetables without any worm castings, and then adding. Uh, worm castings made a difference in their vigor and the quality of the soil. Great. Okay, so we have about five minutes left in our time together, and we have eight questions. So we're gonna motor through them. Yeah. Okay. Ready, Dorothy? Sure. Okay. What's the best way, and how much to water tomatoes grown in pots on my patio, and what variety do you recommend? Two questions in that. Watering and what variety? Well, I, as I say, I really like the hanging basket tomatoes because they're so prolific and, uh, and they're just one plant in a, in a pot. I mean, it doesn't have to be a hanging basket, but, um, but they're very low growing. And um, so that's a lovely variety, but any of the bush tomatoes and even some of the parthenocarpic varieties, if you want to really start early, like the Silets or the, um, or if you like it also depends whether you want a full-sized tomato, a medium-sized tomato, or um, you know one of the smaller cherry type of tomatoes. So if you want a cherry type of tomato, go for one of the vine types. There's so many different varieties. I would suggest that you actually look at, um, at that Bevan Learning Garden site for the tomato descriptions, and it'll give you a much better uh, variety list of varieties than I can say here. And then you can decide what color you want, what size you want, all this kind of stuff. Um, and it, and then go from there and hope that you can find this either the seed or the the plants that you're hoping for. West Coast okay. seeds also is a good. Uh, West Coast so seed is it. very good. Yes. April will stick that list in the chat for you guys. And a Water quick add on daily. Uh, a good. A good patio tomato um, needs a five gallon pot. Uh, yes. And except you're hanging tomatoes, your your tiny tims and um, your basket hangers, you can get away with a three gallon uh, pot. 
but to grow a good healthy tomato on the patio, you need five gallons. And uh, um, I tried my hangers on five gallons and three gallons, got the same harvest. Okay. And Richard said water daily. Daily. <laughs> yes. No exception. Yes, daily. Okay. Next. And and remember that nutrients, of course, are much more limited in a container. And so you're going to have to fertilize a little bit more as you're watering on occasion. Once a week. Once okay. a week for fertilizer, water daily. Excellent. Uh, Robin says, my tomatoes last year developed yellow shoulders and were poor tasting. Is that hot temperature related? Um, I showed you one picture and I can't go back that quickly. Um, blossom end rot in containers actually develop those yellow shoulders sometimes. So um, it could have been that, but it could also have been heat. A um, little hard to say without seeing a picture. Okay. Yeah, lots of people are concerned about the, the effect of temperatures on some of the performance of their... Absolutely. Yeah. Nothing we can do about that either. You can, you, can, you can mitigate it and buy a couple of good thermometers and pay attention to it. Yeah. Um, and so have that uh, um, uh, shade cloth ready uh, or uh, as, as uh, um, Dorothy said, um, put those pots on, uh, on wheels and uh, roll them where you need to roll them. Good stuff. Yeah, the, the, those are good good tips. Um, okay, I've heard that it's good to prune the leaves at the bottom of the plant. Your thoughts? Um, the leaves should never touch the ground. So absolutely okay. prune the leaves that are close enough to the ground and make sure that they don't get sprayed from anything, the either hand watering or maybe your drip system that developed a spray or something like that. Um, yeah, you can take some of the some of the leaves off without any any uh, hardship to the plant that will work perfectly well. So, but I wouldn't take too much off because after all, you need that uh, uh, sugar formation in the leaves and all this kind of just general plant health where you need the leaves to be reasonably there. Okay, great. Can the hardening off be um, straight in? An unheated greenhouse. Staging, yeah, staging an unheated greenhouse when uh, without going back and forth indoors, outdoors. Yes, but having said that, the cuticle formation will only happen in the direct sunshine. So yes, you can be in the unheated greenhouse, but you won't get that real sun protection that um, the plant forms when it is out in the full sunshine. Okay. Um, if you only have one small heat mat, can you keep seedlings cooler once germinated? You can do that. Yeah. Although but make sure they get enough faster. light. Okay. And did we answer the question about where to get a seed mat? Oh, no, any garden uh, center. Any garden, any garden center. center Buckerfields has some, you name it. Yeah. Any, any garden plants. center, internet. Internet, there's all kinds of uh, possibilities. Actually, there. you can't buy them on uh, Amazon anymore. Oh, really? There's no one good seed mat and the rest of them aren't very good. Lots of places you can get them. Lots of places. Oh, Great. Lots yeah. of places, as well as the thermostat. They do come separate. Some some come with and some come without, but I would strongly recommend that you get one that has the thermostat coming with it. It makes it so much easier for the heat control. And similarly for grow lights, get them. Um, the the grow lights you can order separately, and uh, and you don't need anything other than the grow light and some way of hanging them. Obviously, you need to somehow be able to have them over the plants. And again, you can get those at uh, pretty well garden centers or garden um, centers. Even if you, you're so inclined. Also, yeah. yeah also, um, Canadian Tire, Home Depot, you know, they carry the long, the long tubes. Just do a little reading so you know what you're getting. Yeah. So, so you know it is a grow light. The yeah. replacements for the fluorescent tubes. Yeah. You know, right? Yeah. And you but can make get sure them you in... get the right, make sure you get the full, full spectrum, spectrum sunlight. Yeah. yeah. Great. Great. And then the last question is for the library about having a seed library where we can get tomato seeds. 
Um, I'll just let April stick that in the chat. We have um, our website is viral, v i r l dot b c dot c a, and then slash gardening, and we've got all of these events and the um, recorded sessions and our seed libraries because we have thirty nine branches and every branch is a little bit different, which is always exciting. But um, well, yeah. well, you know, my only concern with the Thank with you. the library having having a seed library is is like, uh, don't you have to take them back because you're a library? Don't you have to give the <laughs> yeah. seeds back? Yeah, so that's that's kind of our next. <laughs> no, I <phase>. always <laughs> yeah. Right. At least tomatoes, they you know, if they're open pollinated, <laughs> they kind of come back the same ish. Oh, they Gosh. yeah, I, their kids <laughs> come back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Squat, if you want to take um, community collected squash seeds, you are in for possibly an adventure, which can be fun. <laughs> it uh, can be interesting indeed. <laughs> well, I've I've gotten squash cumbers, so <laughs> you just have to be really adaptable about what you're cooking. <laughs> yeah, you got to be real careful with squash. Any final comments for us, Dorothy? No, I hope. People have enjoyed it and uh, learned something new. Um, many people will have had at least as much experience as I have had gardening for years and years. And uh, enjoy your garden when it comes and the snow is gone. <laughs>